So, John Mannion, thanks very much for joining the show today. How are you? Very good. Good to, good to be here. Good so to talk with you had, again. Absolutely. So you had an awesome, you still have an awesome career. Let's start with something cool. Um, what was your kind of the best and worst moment? If you look back at what you've done in the past, you know, 10, 15 years. Because everybody... Yeah, you know, yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, you know, that's a great question. Uh, you get into talking about, you know, best and worst moments. Uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I learned most from the, the worst moments and I think, uh, that's what makes us better. So I'm always focusing on and looking at how I can, uh, uh, look at some of the things that I've gone through and, and how I can learn from those, uh, how I could have handled it differently, how we could have handled it differently and how we could get better, uh, from that. Uh, I think, uh, so to highlight some of the worst moments, I, I probably have quite a few, uh, from my previous organization at consensus. Um, John, there's, it just there's... means that you've done a lot, but right? if you don't do anything, <laughs> then, then nothing happens, you know? Right. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, that's the thing about business and, and, and sales and partnerships and, you know, you're losing most of the time. And, uh, and when you do have those wins, that's, that's a fun reward. Uh, but, and you, you get excited about to do it again, but the most part, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of losing, uh, and you're learning from that and improving and going back to it. And, and my thinking is if you do lose, it, it may be just a no for now. Maybe that partner or a client can be a, a win later. Right. And, uh, did you ever have to have some difficult conversations with partners specifically? I think that's the we always talk about strategy and strategy is typically works really well when everything is working as planned and when it doesn't, then sometimes strategy is at the window and you got to improvise. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think when you get into, uh, working with partners, you know, ideally you're stepping through it. You're trying to plan out how it goes forward from the beginning, but things happen. Uh, things happen within those organizations, things happen with your organizations that could affect what, what happens in the relationship, but we still move forward. Uh, we're, we're doing damage control before we go live. Um, and then when we go live, there's still a need for that. And there's always times for adjustment and we have to readjust and, and that people are changing. Maybe you have a instrumental key member that's gone from your team or their team. Um, but you still have to pick up the pieces and, and get back on track. And it takes a relationship, you know, a cadence. Uh, and uh, when you have that with a partner and you have them understanding their piece of it, uh, your team understanding and your organization supporting what you're doing, then that partnership and uh, and sale and engagement can be a, a very strong long-term one. And you speak in general terms. Do you have any stories you can you can share with that? You know, assuming we can obfuscate some of the details and if not from the you know, recent, maybe like distant past that you can share. Because that's what you just see. But I think that's like, again, it's, it's, it's a lot of these stories never come to to air because it's only maybe the group of people that deal with it. Uh, it's been, you know, under the covers. Uh, and unless you experience it on your own, you know, these stories stay, like these dealings stay behind closed doors. Yeah, no, I mean... You know, over the years, you, you know, uh, you know, you have a lot of those stories. I think, uh, you know, a recent one that was an interesting journey, which, you know, I wouldn't point to any particular part of the partnership, but the previously, uh, we're, we're selling a SaaS based solution, working with Verizon, right? And I work heavily with, with, uh, telcos over the last 20 years and work with Verizon. Um, there's a lot of moving parts again, uh, what, what. Uh, what some of the challenge consisted of was technical challenge on implementation, um, technical support, uh, great resources moving on uh, from from that uh, organization from Verizon, and and having to deal with the change and who they who they follow up with. And before we ever got there, we had uh, eight months of uh, legal back and forth, right, uh, where everything was stalled because you can imagine um, what that process is like and, and all the boxes that need to be checked all the red lines that are going back and forth and continue to keep the momentum and the go to market strategy, uh, there so that, uh, um, 
we can be successful in the go live and the go to market and the sales enablement with the sales team and the, and the, and the sales engineers. And then, and then once the orders start happening, how do we process those? And how do we implement those? And how do we receive those? And how do we remedy any errors on the back end? So there's so many pieces that go into uh, a strong partnership. Um, you can expect uh, the unexpected. If everything goes smooth, great. But you expect it uh, to go sideways um, almost daily. And, and if you do that, then you're prepared. And, and I think that that's the biggest thing is being prepared uh, for outcomes that may not be ideal. And I think going into partnership, like what if things happen here? What if things go there? Because you're prepared for it. And then when, you, when it happens, you're not as surprised and uh, it doesn't fall to pieces. It just needs uh, some fixing back on track. Uh, and, uh, and, and you work with your partner or you do what you need to do for your partner to make sure that that happens. You mentioned it takes so long, right, to even have the agreement in place to teach the seniors. And there's a saying, the time is the killer of all transactions. How do you, how do you manage that process? As somebody who's a, who's a leader, probably the kind of the mastermind behind to making the transaction happen, how do you deal with all these constraints? Like all those people are involved, the large companies, the legal, the, all the different moving parts and make sure that it's like a large boat. It's like a cruise ship, but you have to make sure it doesn't sway over to, to a different direction. It's very hard to... It is. I mean, and, you know, there's a different, a few different things to look at it from a, from a very high level. You look at everything as not an end goal, but a, a journey, right? And and when you're going through it, the first journey will be to get the contract and do the kickoff. The next journey is, is onboarding. The next journey is how do we improve this relationship, right? So... You know, but the first goal is get the contract and start the partnership. And when you start with the end in mind, you kind of walk back all the pieces that need to be there and you execute a high level plan and list on what we need to accomplish and what sort of time frames we think that they'll fall in. And you know, the first phase may be getting their buy-in that we thought it was going to take three months. It takes nine months. Maybe it's an urgency. Maybe it's a priority. We we hit them at the right time. It's a priority, right? So first you get their buy-in and then it's working through from there. If, if our solution is what they need, right? Do they want this? Do they want to go to the SMB space with a security offering? Uh, is, is the security offering the right one? Uh, are we going to provide the right support for what they need? Um, are they going to target the right areas and markets to go after? And, and you start to define these different things and then you get into it the planning is important and making sure that you have all the resources uh, that you need on the back end and you're outlining what those are. So you're not showing up again, ill prepared. And, uh, and at the same time, they may be very ill prepared, but uh, they may be the stronger partner, the stronger client. Uh, and they they dictate a lot of this. And all you can do is do your best to stay on track on course on the schedule that you you already initially try to determine, but you know things may change. And the idea is when you have many of those going on, some of those move forward and some of those take longer, uh, but you understand the process and you become a experienced uh, a leader uh, for your team and or representative if you're the rep. And, and then you continue to, to ask for the next step in the process, right? And it keeps moving things along. And when you think about telcos companies, there's quite a bit of transition that happens in the past, I would say even two years, five years. Uh, and I know that a lot of these telcos are now dwelling into the kind of the security space, even though it's not so much in their DNA. When you think telco, you don't necessarily think security. And and everybody hates them. Like I think that the most hated uh sector i think just because what they in nature of what it is that they do everybody blames the infrastructure behind when things go wrong uh so the other question to one how do you how do you decide how you or should you even decide as a vendor that you want to work with somebody like that <laughs> again yeah you know you're laughing but you know it's true because maybe you get enamored by how many people they have 
you know, how many clients they have or what revenue they do, but then mm-hmm. there, there might not be a fit to begin with. Such an interesting space. I and mean, even the term telco, it, it's hard for people to understand. What, what does that mean? So, it, 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 you know, when I think about the communication service provider space, right? And shortly, you know, a short time ago, they owned everything. They had the voice, data, TV, phone, everything went through them. And this is before the the blowing up of, of, of the UCAS space with Ring Central, uh, before the blowing up of the cloud based hyperscalers who dominate, right? And they were the ones, right? They weren't the ones that had the wireline, they had the wireless, they have everything, right? Um, and so th- those folks, the one thing they, they do know how to do is find customers and, and try to maintain those customers and By the way, Not to, to cut you off, I got double click. When they had everything, it was also, also quite the gravy train. Meaning they, people had no choices but to sign up and pay you know, like I remember what the T1 connection was right. thousands of dollars. Right. You know, a private, you know, private network, uh, you know, was huge money. Those costs yeah. were millions of dollars. Yeah. All right. Like, continue. I didn't mean that. No, no, no. You, you, you're exactly right. I mean, uh, that was the business is selling pipes, selling minutes, right? When things were, were built on a minutes basis and, so, and, and, you know, at that, some of those times I was looking at on the, on the back end, working with them, managing the network or managing the billing, which managed per minute in all these different area codes is complicated, right? So, so what they have changed in, okay, we provide a pipe. Now it was multiple pipes. Now it's down to a pipe, but they, they still have, again, a large customer base. They have a footprint that there's a lot of smaller vendors out there, a lot of broadband vendors, um, there's a lot of push in, in, in connecting America, right? And, and so there's a, lot, there's a lot of dollars being spent to improve the infrastructure, but then there's other services that are needed, right? And cyber is one of those things. It's, it's popular, it's a need because there's a concern there, right? And, uh, and I think what these telcos trends will, will look at a little bit differently depending on the market they go after. Like how big is your footprint? How big is the region you're trying to cover? How are there mostly residential? Is it business? Are you nationwide? Are you are you the largest in the world, or are you regional in a certain part of, of the U.S. and and because of that, you're you're trying to say, look, I need to give everything to my clients. You know, this is a business in the box solution. Who do I care about? Maybe they're enterprise. Maybe they're SMB. Maybe they're residential. Understand that, and then understand what those folks need. And then bringing those things to those folks in a way that's easy for them to digest. And, and people like the idea of less bills, right? Even though they automate the billing and, you know, it takes, they like to not have as many. And if I can get um, all of my solutions from one vendor, it's still ideal for a lot of folks, businesses and others. And they still feel like, you know, with all these services, they can get more competitive rate, which is true, which is true. So. So I think there, there's still, as these telcos who have a lot of dollars at the bank can morph and change and provide other services, there's a, definitely a big upside because if they do it right, they, 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 they're in a position that other organizations are, aren't and won't be. And, and uh, that really will help, help small businesses, residential, get the, the, the services that they really have been waiting to get. In, in CST, the kind of the line for me, or to become commoditized, and people have options now. I'm assuming they losing customers or revenue on a regular basis, and so they're looking to venues to, to add on and provide additional value to the client. Right, so maybe hence the cybersecurity, which is a matter of national security anyway. You need a stronger infrastructure for our artists and bees. People that don't know how to get themselves. Uh, how can you, as a vendor, potentially fill in that gap? A provide the short revenue source. B provide that expertise which you don't have. And how do you even manage that whole relationship? Like, let's say you're a vendor of two hundred, trying to work with an organization of uh, twenty-five thousand, five thousand, with all the, yeah. um, the intricacies associated with working with such large enterprise. Even I'm, I'm assuming even creating the, the combined billing is different today, let alone yeah. 
No, I mean, you know, I, I think that's that's the one thing that, you know, when you look at communication providers, that typically they have infrastructure. So they have the bill, the strength of the billing and if they have those engines in place, right? So rolling out new services, that that doesn't need to take as much change and transition as if you're looking at MSPs, managed service providers who are offering these services. They're getting more and more complex. How 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 big are they? But then managing it on the back end can be a challenge, right? So no matter where they're coming at, and they are colliding in a good way, right? So there are more more options for for businesses and people to get these services. But uh, uh, you know, the one thing that the broadband telco space they haven't gotten into the application layer, if you will. They they haven't. They've been more of a a commodity in the fact that you need this service, this pipe. I don't care what you use it for. Here you go. Now they get into a space where what do you what are you trying to do? Oh, you're a small business that does this. Well, you don't even need to know the details. You do need security. You do need email service. You need backup. You need so forth. And if they can get in that discussion where they can provide those things that most organizations generally use, almost like utilities, right? Then, uh, but communication utilities, then they then they're provided the service that they were prior, which is communication tools, right? Which is why they're a communication service provider, right? And some choose to just be a portion of that, and some fiber providers want to be wholesale, right? But if you're taking this to the businesses, then you want to have a solution that gives them the communication tools in a box, and uh, and that's where you have to learn a little bit about some of these applications. And for security, if you put the right tools in place with a unified dashboard that can do many things, it's one of the things Corum does centralized dashboard, it can be easier. It's not as hard as it was, right? Um, and now, uh, because these more recently built tools and technology, there's a lot of automation in there. Uh, I dare to say the word AI, but there's machine learning, there's automation that help uh, speed up the process of remediation as opposed to uh, legacy where you had to dial it. You had to, you got to start to read it. Only some people can read it. So now it, there's a lot of automated functionality there, which is tremendous in helping speed up um, the amount of endpoints that can be protected. And the other challenge, challenge is to talk about large, large, large numbers. numbers. You know, potentially every little thing that when you have a team of, of 10, 15, it's not a big deal. You can somehow work it out, work out the kinks. So we're talking about some of these regions have to do millions of dollars in revenue. And so everything can get amplified by what kind of, uh, you know, nuts and bolts or like infrastructure or the pipes, pun intended, that require to, to have all of this happen and, and generate that, that massive revenue. Yeah. You know, it's, um, you know, when we work with, uh, you know, all size, um, providers, right. Um, but you know these, these these providers have large infrastructure. They're also using some of the the uh, cloud based providers for some of the infrastructure support. Um, you know we utilize them as well, and and uh, that's where security is important from, from that standpoint. And this has really been the story of cybersecurity has been it this, it brings it to the enterprise uh, space. The, the complexity is there, right? Having a chief information security officer it is Everyone has one, and if you don't have one, you're getting one, or you have a director of security and so forth. And and to bring and there's a lot of different vendors, and it's diversified because you have the resources and the teams. But uh, going down down market, and so you have the infrastructure going down market. It's harder to to have you know those resources. So you need tools that are that are better centralized. Um, but uh, definitely, it's definitely one of those things where in the telco space and the communication provider space. There's the big tier twos, the tier ones, and they have the majority of the infrastructure. And then regionally, there's small infrastructure set up for the tier, the small tier twos, tier threes. And, and they're the ones that are, they have a small group managing what they have. And they need tools that are easy, easy for their customers, easy for them to manage. And although diversification can be great uh, with a lack of resources, 
it could be next to impossible. And then the choice becomes, I, I'm not going to do anything, or I'm going to use the legacy piece. So that's, so that's where they're they're can there's creating this great divide. Uh, so you know the one thing you know we're doing, other organizations are doing as well, is to how do we make this with automation and and centralized dashboard make this easier for uh, these these organizations to to manage this tech and get this tech at least ninety five percent of the, the way there uh, without this huge investment. And how do you propagate some of the the knowledge transfer from from your organization to some of the telcos? How do you make sure that the the word in the street or the you know, the sales force understands it and is able to communicate the value at the customer? Because especially when the product does so much, platform does so much, and you have mm-hmm. different areas of of, of uh, benefits to the client. How do you propagate that? That's a part of kind of a robust channel program to be able to. Yeah, yeah. No, and you know, uh, I I appreciate you 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 know, pivoting this this part of the discussion because I think a lot of the times, you know, we get into you know, organizations you say you know either I want to go into the channel program or I want to drive sales this way, and they don't think it out and they don't uh, bring in the right assistance and help to advise on certain things. I want to jump into marketplaces. Yeah, I want to do it. And Jonathan, I think I think you're hundred percent correct. And I know it's boring if I agree with you all the time, but a lot of them just get enamored by the end result. Think yeah. okay, if we can get this partner, we exponentially increase our sales. Mm-hmm. But they don't they don't think about what it takes from to get from from the point you are right now to that end goal. And it's very intricate. There's the people like yourself who been there, done that. It had the start mm-hmm. and show for it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean it. It, it is. It is exciting. The potential, um, you know. And there's different things. You get a market with an enterprise group. Oh, I got. I, it's just the right people in here, and I'm gonna get these big logos. Um, that's not that easy. Uh, you have a. a you build a, a channel or a call center, and you call this pitch. It's gonna work. It's not that easy. You have a channel program. We're gonna get these telecom broker master agents in and the doors will open and distribution partners like this. Well, no, unfortunately, no. And it takes knowing which ones are mature and have a real program and do they have a real program for your products and how do you go about selling it? Is your, if, is your organization prepared to do that? Do you have the right sales organization to do that with this particular marketplace? There's so many layers to it. And I think, um, you know, it, it takes having the right, the right folks to give you the right blueprint and plan. And then you need that same organization to consistently say, okay, you're on track. Um, these are the sorts of folks you need, or, or you, you're off track or, you know what, you shouldn't go down this road and here's why. Right. And, and, and that advisory role of, and action is typically not taken. And, and typically it becomes just failure after failure and, and maybe some successes, uh, and maybe those are repeatable successes. Maybe they fell into it, but it, it, it's, it's hard to, to get across and educate groups that, uh, maybe have success in one area of channel and, but maybe not in others and, and apply it across the board because one size does not fit all. And, uh, so you have to look at everything differently and, and, uh, one marketplace could be great. One's not one distributor could be excellent, another, but absolutely not. And uh, and then what are the products that you're offering? What's the segments you're going after? What verticals are you going after? All of this needs to be analyzed and discussed and then have a plan on which one we're going to do in this quarter, this year, and so forth. So that was a kind of a high-level overview, and I, I would love to get down into the weeds, maybe some <laughs> topics of what you guys. Sure. So the first first... You're big into getting a uh, buy-in from executives to even start a, like a real channel. Mm-hmm. Why is that important? And how do you convince or if, they, if you need convincing, like, cause some companies just say, well, we don't want to do channel, but we're not ready for it. Yeah. Uh, there's, nah. there's a whole kind of hurdles. So how do you start? 
Yeah, I've been, in, I've been in that environment, you know. I've been in that environment where an organization says, we really want to do a channel. And then you find out that uh, there's been five folks before you that started it and never completed it. And and it, was it their fault or maybe it was an organization um, had a lack of support, right? And it sounds like uh, he's speaking from experience. I don't know if it was a five <laughs> number, but yeah, it changed a little bit, but maybe yeah. between two and seven. Yeah, and, and the thing is, you know, and you still could have a lot of success, which I did at that organization, and uh, still was able to prove it. But at the, at the end of the day, you know, um, you can only teach an old dog new tricks, so to to a certain degree, right? And, and that's okay. Uh, the, the the point is, you know, you, you you what you're able to do in that role, you understand the organization, say what you can do, and so when you do an organization, you say, look, are you a direct sales organization? Okay. Are you a channel organization? Most organizations should say from a leadership perspective, we're both, right? Uh, and we coexist. We work together. And here's how. And you tell us how if we don't know how, but we're committed to this, right? Because at the end of the day. Can you really be both? Uh, I, I believe uh, depending. Again, so it depends on your products, right? Um, it really does depend on the products, uh, the verticals you're going after. Are you selling to segments of SMB, consumer, mid-market, up to enterprise? So it really does depend. But the way you go to market has to be specific to that segment in that vertical and has to be part of the plan. And maybe it's a direct for this particular segment of vertical. Maybe here it's all channel. But if you don't dissect it and look at it through those lenses, um, you will miss some things. And, and can you have... A uh, hundred different ways you go to market? No. But can you have a few? Yes. And uh, again, you have to prioritize. Uh, and you have to have a strong plan and a committed team that understands the plan. And uh, and use the tools. You know, there, there are some great tools out there. The tools can do the job for you. But the tools can be assisting you to do the job. Uh, if you have a tool that does great recordings and great information and, and you learn from it and you get better and you're always looking at getting better, great. If you have uh, tools that uh, you're using, but they're not increasing your, your the knowledge you have as a team, you're, there's no coaching happening within the organization, your rate of closing is still not going, it's not going, it's going the wrong direction, uh, then you then the tools don't matter, right? And you have a challenge there where you have a, uh, you need to look yourself in the mirror and say, do I have the right leadership here? Uh, do I have the right directors here? And and that's a tough a tough question. But again, you have to step back and, and say, look, what's my end goal here? Revenue. But revenue is my end goal. So keeping that in mind, what do I have to put in place so that we are we are successful? So let's assume that you successfully managed to get buy-in from the executive team and, and they, they had to decide to be a hybrid uh, channel versus, you know, and direct or just strictly channel. What does the, and you got hired and to, to clean up and decide to, to go ahead. Like how does, how does the first 90 days look like? And how do you monitor that you are in the, in the right path? And what is the moment? Is there a moment where you like unveil the curtain and you start all of a sudden start the channel? Like, how does that work? Like, you crack something and and then all of a sudden, like, that we're ch we're now channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I you know, it, it. First of all, it's never a, um, you know, you, you hear these stories about enlightenment. There's no bright light that happens, um, but you start to see things differently. You know, you're not waiting for. You stop asking the question. You know, do I need, do I need, do I, do I know channel? You, you know, you know channel. You don't need to go ask a guru if there's enlightenment, right? So I think, you know, it, when you get into an organization, you're always evaluating initially and you're evaluating um, how and where we're at today and what resources we have and what, what are we good at and, and what, what does leadership want? And then, then you come to a certain point where you can start asking. You already start ask a lot of questions. And I think the key to everything is continue to ask the questions, right? And sometimes they're being well-received. Oh, I'm glad you're asking that question. Sometimes they're not well-received. Like, why are you asking that question? Like, well, 
because we want to get better. And that's a hard question, I know. But but we get through this, we will get better. That's all you're trying. You're always keeping that in mind. Like It's all about getting better than where we were. And if you're going to be direct, this is, you don't do this anymore. You do this. It's very focused and it's this. And if you run into this, that's going to be moved into a different group. Okay, but be really good at this. So focus is important. And the plan and, and the way in which you go to market is important. Uh, and I, and I, you know, uh, I, I, I have to bring up uh, the solution selling and consultative approach. Uh, it has to be a part of everything you do because at the end of the day, that's how we're going to discover if we're even a fit for our partners or clients. If we ask the, the probing questions, because when we do, we it uncovers w w what they're trying to reach. Right? Um, I want to have a lot of. I want as a partner, I want to make a lot of dollars, not change any of my management skills or any resources. I want to get. Uh, a high rate of return and uh, low failure for everything we roll out, right? And I want you as a partner to do everything and 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 spend the money on the marketing of this product. Okay, so that's not going to happen, but you know you you're trying to get there with everything that you do as best you can, and and in putting a plan together uh, so that when you do roll out a channel program, you can say, look, this is the first part of our channel program is focused on this. Uh, the next phase will be these. The next we will graduate here. And then we're, meanwhile, while you're rolling these out, you're always exploring other areas. You're always continuing to explore, and, and, and but you're not putting resources on it until you feel confident that, okay, now we're ready to put some resources into this. And, and we know that there will be a return, and, uh, and, and, and this is how we're going to go after it, right? So um, it is a journey. Right. And, uh, and with channel, nothing's a direct line. Um, but, uh, but because you work with channel, there's more on the other side, right? A partner opens the doors to many doors that you wouldn't have access to, as opposed to knocking on one door at a time. Um, so it takes a lot of planning, a lot of strategy, but, uh, understanding and experience. Right. And, uh, and, uh, it's scary. It can be scary. A lot of things are to people that haven't done it, right? I don't know how that works. So I'm a little bit scared. And, you know, that's why you want to try to, you know, improve and be well-rounded so you don't run into those sorts of things, which, um, you know, in sales and channel sales, what is going to happen? I mean, how do you pick the first couple partners? I mean, do you, is it typically friendlies, people that you know, or is it a particular market? Or is the, the little segment, the typical size? How do you find it? Because that's, I think, also one of the key aspects of is how a successful launch is to to show some successful marginal success by right. by you know attaching yourself to, to the correct partner. Yeah. No, I think I think it is a matter of utilizing the relationships you have and know and and getting their input. You know, uh, Honestly, you know, take go to your partners and and trusted advisors whether you think they're a good fit or not, and and say, look, I have something here. It's different, it's new, uh, but I want to get your opinion on it, right? And again, uh, it, you, you want their honest opinion. Uh, that helps you. Uh, you you want to take it to people and say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? Is this something that you know from your position, your organization? You're not the decision maker on this you would take on um, someone in your similar role at a similar organization would be interested in this. And I think you start to explore that and, and then you start to explore what areas uh, I, I need to sharpen up uh, our program. Right. And you know, already, you know, what sort of things should be in place, but you want to take it out there to, to these partners and say, hey, let's get an idea. And then, and then from there, uh, there will be the questions like, well, what do you think, uh, what, what can we do with this? What, you know, what, what do you think we could make with this? Then you get into the commercial terms discussion where you're looking at the, uh, the upside and the potential. And, uh, and now it's a lot more fun discussion about just growing together. Yeah. And, and tell me, um, selling has, has changed in the past, you know, several years. How's it? 
affecting the channel programs and how people go to market or if it does? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, uh, I think we've, we've spoken about it. You know, there's so many different ways to communicate with people. Uh, LinkedIn is not a place where you uh, just go to, uh, to communicate with a couple of people or find a technician, you know, way back in the day, it's different now that it can be a great resource. You have many tools out there that could be great resources and, and you want to keep evaluating, uh, these tools and, and how you can utilize them for, um, automation, lead gen, um, partner improvement and continue to look at these, adding these tools and, and moving on from tools if they're not, uh, the right ones for you. Um, but this is how you get better at managing that flow, right? And uh, the flow of of, of leads uh, through your partner program, for example, with referral agent program uh, and getting it into the hands of your sales reps and then speeding up that process and giving the information beforehand so they have the background, right? So it's, a, it's you know, the process needs to be in place. The tools help improve the process and then the, both complement each other. You improve the process because the tools are there, uh, and, and then you improve the uh, the tools based on the process you're putting in place, and then the execution of the teams continue to educate, learn, and get better, and then everyone's rising, right? And uh, and again, uh, the, the idea of getting better uh, is 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 what helps motivate um, the team, and, and they're like, oh, they find they find different ways to add to and improve the process, right? It becomes a cultural thing and then, uh, and then success will follow. Uh, do you, do you find any exciting technologies that are shaping the need of companies to, to get more security solutions? We've seen like, um, you know, just a deep fake, uh, some AI, some phishing is always in the news. Any mm -hmm. type of driving, because what we say is like, you know, tight, low toll bolts. So from a cybersecurity perspective, there's never a dull moment. We always see these yeah. are new. So is that what's pushing the market to to go downstream into kind of the SMB space as well? Yeah, I mean, I think it I think when from a security standpoint, the more uh technology is out there, the more things that'll be utilized, you know, whether you have your mobile devices in the workspace, IoT devices in the workspace. Um you know, that's big and in getting into medical, but IoT is big, how we protect those, um, you know, getting into uh, network protection, the various ways we do network, uh, yeah, the more the more we're networking, uh, it, all all these pieces and, and then the creative ways in which uh, the, the phishing attacks come, right? Um, we, we have to make sure that we're maintaining um, uh, this. And at, at the enterprise level, they're looking at all these things because that's a full-time uh, role of an individual, but down market, it's not, right? It's not being looked at and the tools are, there's a lot of gaps, right? And, and so to go down market, you, you know, the, the, there is a big challenge with the cyber companies that are down market is because how they fix a lot of these you know, areas that, you know, are not being managed uh, by multiple, multiple areas, but by minimal, right? And to, and how do they continue to add different modules and and tools so that they can have the protection? And there's always new tech coming out, so that is kind of the challenge of the game. And uh, um, it's exciting from a business perspective that there are more tools. Um, it's a challenge from the cyber, but it's also what keeps us in business. And uh, uh, and you know, you know, being in telecom and tech uh, since I started, and I I don't know. <laughs> I keep coming back to it and, and you do as well because that's the geeks that we are, but that's what it is, you know, and uh, it's, ex it's ex I think it's an exciting time. It's also, uh, yeah, it can be a nervous time. Yeah. And so how did you get started? I'm just curious. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I, I was in the Chicago, uh, outside of uh, Chicago and Illinois and, you know, looking at uh, different careers and if we, if, I had got approached by more insurance companies than I ever thought. And uh, I said, I, I can't go into insurance. I don't even know, you know, it, uh, insurance is a very good business. And, um, but there was an opportunity to get a technology and I, and I said, you know, okay, you know, you're looking at different technology companies and 
uh, approach company, Lucent Technologies, right? New cutting edge technology company, formerly part of AT and T. <laughs> so it wasn't that new, but to me at that time, not knowing very much, it was very new. And uh, honestly, it was a exciting uh, team to join. The amount of acquisitions uh, that they were doing uh, per quarter at that time uh, was tremendous, and uh, it was very overwhelming, but very very addictive in a way. Uh, and, uh, and then that would expose me to call setters and telecoms and, and, and then I was stuck <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> There's a lot of automation now, part of a quote unquote, so you know, I've seen, yeah. I've, I've seen, um, you know, out of dialers, uh, conversation bots, uh, you know, automated, the uh, content generation, uh, Potentially, are we looking at a whole channel in a box, it's like automated system within the next 10 to 16 months? You know, uh, it, it's such a great term in, in technology, too, it, it, no matter, you know, where you go about it in a box, right? And and some of our, some of the, well, black box, I meaning you have no idea what's inside. No, that's true. Yeah. A black box, too. So there, there's always these these boxes of products that everybody's trying to put a box, and you're not you're not wrong because that's really what you want. You want to say, okay, I got everything here. That's all, yeah. But there's always something else that needs to be put in the box, right? And that's true too. And but I do I think that there could be complete automation. I think there will be more and more automation, but I think there's going to be more and more areas that need to be protected. Uh, and, but I do think automation is going to be a great help in a lot of the remediation and management of the networks, which is operating at a very fast speed and will continue to operate at a faster and faster speed. So, um, yeah, it, I think it'll, it'll get better. I do think, uh, cyber, although it's been around for some time, it's still in its infancy and there's a lot of areas that can improve, but the consolidation is going to start happening and. The centralization of this is going to start happening, and uh, and definitely the automation will continue to improve, and uh, uh, and that that kind of goes across the board with a lot of things. But that um, I think what Chat GPT has really opened the doors to people's minds in in allowing this to be a real thing, and it'll continue to expand and improve other areas that aren't necessarily related to. Um, to that initial, but it's going to be, it's going to be exciting. And, and I already see it happening, uh, with the, with the Coral's applications and in the space of cyber. So. Do you don't think the last channel manager has already been born? <laughs> the last channel managers will be automated. I think, uh, there, 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 there's a place for marketplaces. There's some places for some things to be automated, but there's always going to be a, a place for, uh, relationships to be, um, started and managed and, and, and coming in to problem solve. Uh, and, uh, but it'll look differently, you know, and, and different skills will have to be, uh, um, sharpened, which I think a lot of people are up for it. Again, it's just evolution. People like to learn uh, and people want to learn and people want to improve and do different things. And the skills, skills start to change. Right. Um, but, uh, I think the skill of any good channel manager and, and channel leader is, is understanding, adapting, stepping back and, and trying to problem solve and, uh, and then, you know, continue to build relationships and, and open doors and, uh, and that, that's not going away. Um, maybe some of the details of how we do it may change. And you don't think the relationship has, has changed? I mean, the, pandemic caused us to be isolated for a couple of years. And then when we came back, I don't know if we're fully, you know, we do a lot of this stuff. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's a fascinating thing. The next best thing. Um, and then I don't know if they, you know, certain age groups, if they value relationship, like, like, you know, like we do, or yeah. how is that even relationship even look like? Maybe relationship is your online presence. Maybe it's how you conduct yourself publicly uh, through various means like social media. Oh, yeah. Relationship is everything, right? So yeah. uh, 
how do you adapt to kind of the new world order where I think a lot of these buyers, tech buyers, they do a lot of the decisions prior to even contacting you, like 80% of it, just by researching you, finding out who you are, what you stand for, what you mm-hmm. stand for, and so on. Building the marginal, and that's true for channel and for product. Yeah. Only the marginal, like the last mile, use the telco term, is important where they want to talk to a person. Right. No, I mean, you know, from some organizations just use chat for support, uh, you know, to, uh, to, you know, it's hard to get someone on the phone because it's more costly. Right. So you walk it back just a few years ago, you look at Apple as a product, it's a consumer product. It was built for consumer and that's a big part of business. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, these, these things, things are changing. And, uh, and that's the one thing you, you can't have your, um, you know, your hands clenched you gotta stay, stay solid. It's, you gotta be adaptable and, and fluid and, uh, and comfortable with being fluid and, and allow for the change because that, that's the one thing you can count on. Right. So I think it's important to be, be, be fluid and going with it. But as those things start to happen, we'll start to see, um, new opportunities come from it. And uh, just like new, cha- new, new disruptive things, um, this is uh, this this is disruptive. Social is what it is. Well, it can also be a positive thing, you know. And just like here, we're having this discussion here, and uh, social presence. I can't be in so many places across the country, although I'd love to in person. Um, I can do more sometimes remote, and I need to get the most out of time. And I think that that that'll continue, although there's no replacing a face-to-face discussion or, or sitting down and having a, a, a coffee or whatnot. I think it, that's important to, uh, to have both. It's just now there's more avenues again, just like there's more avenues of communication. There's now more avenues of, uh, communicating your message or messages or, um, uh, marketing or expanding your footprint. And, um, and so it's interesting. And I don't know if anyone has it figured out or if there ever will, um, but it's definitely changing the landscape and it's, uh, um, uh, some days frustrating and, but most days is fun. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I always surprised me. I, I met a few people after doing this and they were what may way taller than, than I expected. <laughs> yeah. You know, cause it's only, it's funny. It's, uh, we have so much nonverbal communication, right. That we do, uh, through this medium. You know, whether it's audio or video, and then you meet in person, a lot of views. So there's even this, you know, I've, I've seen a video about like how when you shake somebody's hand, you know, there's certain like pheromones that move from, or like, some, you know, move from, from your hand to their hand, and vice versa. They create this trust. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll have, we'll sold that too. Maybe there's going to be tactile suits where we <laughs> or handshake and as soon as you yeah. get on the, you know, I think technology is uh, is moving faster than we can ever anticipate. Absolutely, uh, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me if there's something of that nature. But I, I, I do think there, I do think younger generations are still have the need for the same thing. Um, it's a human nature thing. We all have a need for 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 nature. You know, we 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 enjoy our technology. We need our technology in today's world, um, but we enjoy interaction. It's you know, a lot of things haven't changed, although a ton has. But, uh, you know, it, being in the space of technology, I think it's mostly enhancing. And, and we just have to be smart to uh, regulate um, um, ourselves uh, a bit, um, you know, uh, in, as, as a society. But uh, but I think, you know, you know, when it comes to you know, business and driving and 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 whether you're going direct sales, indirect sales, I, I can't emphasize enough, you know, that you know, I I, I hope and, and try to see every organization have a solid plan and and not go out there with a, a half baked plan or not even baked plan. And I like them to have a, a fully baked plan and have buy in and and have support and and love to see successes. And you see it. I like great organizations that do it the right way, and and that's exciting and. Uh, you know, I'm happy to be a part of one. Yeah, absolutely. So if you uh, if you fail to plan, you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, like the cliche. 
<laughs> there you go. Uh, so before we part ways, a couple things. One is you struck you as a very positive person. Maybe, if, you know, in cybersecurity is always like very morose kind of, you know, this <laughs> thing. So, you know, on edge all the time. Maybe there's a couple positive things that you can contribute and think you've seen or experienced um, before we part ways. And then the other piece is that provide some insight in terms of, of uh, how can people reach out to you, uh, what are the areas that you like to, to engage with people, and then we'll, we'll part ways. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think the, the you wake up in the morning and you have a, a mindset you can set and you understand that, look, the, there's a lot of things wrong in this world, uh, in this place, in this life, and then we can always look at it that way. But I think you want to, uh, have a perspective that, you know, whatever it may come across, I can handle it. I'm excited about taking on that challenge. And, and, and again, uh, at the end of the day, you're just trying to get a little bit better, do something a little bit better than yesterday or make you feel a little bit better, make someone else feel a little bit better. And that's going to help bring you to the top. And, and that's a philosophy I try to follow. Uh, don't always, but try my best, uh, again, approach everything humbly and, and try to get better. But, uh, as far as getting a hold of me, uh, you know, I'm LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn and, you know, uh, doing a lot of good work here at Coro uh, as we're building out our global uh, uh, telecom and ISV tech partners, uh, franchise partners, and marketplaces. So you can get a hold of me um, uh, via LinkedIn and, uh, and, and leading our cyber efforts here at Coro. Good stuff, and you know I love following. I love following and seeing your your notes and posts on LinkedIn. Very insightful, and thanks very much for joining the show. Much appreciated. I really enjoyed the conversation today. Absolutely the same, David. I appreciate inviting me. And until then, thanks for all who joined us today. Stay safe online as well as offline. I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you again.